Well, I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy as we begin tonight a new study in this book, this wonderful book of 2 Timothy. I trust that you will be accustomed to opening your Bibles on Sunday evenings for some period of time, that after a while it will just naturally open to this wonderful book. We have just finished the book of Galatians, which is the first epistle that Paul ever wrote, and we now fast forward to the last epistle that Paul wrote. We turn to the book of 2 Timothy, and you'll find by way of contrast that the book of Galatians was the fieriest epistle Paul ever penned. And at the beginning of 2 Timothy, we will read of the fond affection that will come from the heart of Paul toward his son in the faith, Timothy. The title of this message is, Last Words for a Spiritual Son. I want to begin reading 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, peace, or mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience, the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you, even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that is in you as well. For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. These words begin the last communication that Paul will have with the outside world. He has now languished in a cold dungeon in the Mamertine prison in Rome. I have stood there. It is beneath the surface of the earth. It is just all but carved out of stone. Nothing could have been more Spartan. Nothing could have been more dreary than this Mamertine prison in Rome in which Paul now finds himself, and it is the result of persecution under Nero. Why he was under arrest, or even where he was arrested, is unknown. At his preliminary hearing, Paul received no support. He stood alone, And his trial is still being awaited, but he knows he will be executed. Most of his friends found it convenient to be somewhere else. And the aged apostle is now chained like a common criminal in this dark hole in the ground. He is confined. He is a prisoner facing certain death. Unlike his first imprisonment in Rome that is described for us in Acts chapter 28, this time Paul knows he will never escape. In this, his second Roman imprisonment. It is winter time, and the bitter cold of winter has, has socked in. This will be Paul's last winter on earth. The end of his life, he knows, is now here. The only occasion by which he will escape His prison cell is when he will be led out west of Rome to the Ostian Way where his head will be severed from his body. Paul now knows there will be no release from this prison cell except for his own beheading. Within months, if not weeks, maybe days, the Roman soldiers will come to this prison cell and they will come for him, and his death is now imminent. He is alone, he is cold in this dungeon, and this veteran missionary has something last to say. This letter, 2 Timothy, is in reality his last will and testament. 
This letter is addressed to young Timothy, who is Paul's understudy, his protege in the ministry. Paul has invested much time and much prayer in this young man, Timothy. Timothy is now in Ephesus where Paul has placed him. He was there when Paul wrote 1 Timothy, and he remains there still as he now writes 2 Timothy. Knowing that the end is here, Paul desires to see Timothy one last time for his own encouragement, but because he wants to pass on to young Timothy that which is primary and that which is foundational in the ministry. Paul has already told him all of these things, but he wants to reinforce it in young Timothy. He wants to make sure that the passing of the baton from his hand to Timothy is a secure handoff, that nothing will be fumbled in the exchange. And should Timothy not be able to come for Paul to look into his eyes and to directly tell him one more time what is absolutely non-negotiable, what is absolutely essential in gospel ministry. Paul records it in this letter. And as he records it in this letter, these are the last words of Paul to his young son in the faith. Uh, This book is only four chapters. Everything that Paul will say in this short last epistle will be extremely important. There will be no wasted words. Uh, There will be no wasted verses. Here is the final instruction in being a man of God. Here is what is most important in gospel ministry. Here is personal encouragement from the senior preacher to his young successor. In so doing, Paul admonishes Timothy to cling to sound doctrine and to defend it against all error and to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Would you like to be more effective in your ministry here upon the earth? Would you like the wise counsel of the Apostle Paul in matters pertaining to living a life that is effectively and mightily used by God? If so, then 2 Timothy is the book for you and it is the book for me. Now, as we look at these verses this, this evening, there are three main headings that I want you to note. I want you to see Paul's greeting in verses 1 and 2, Paul's gratitude in verses 3 through 5, and then finally, Paul's guidance in verses 6 and 7. Paul's greeting, Paul's gratitude, and Paul's guidance. Very simple outline. Note first Paul's greeting in verses 1 and 2. This letter begins, as was the custom of the day, in writing an epistle, which is a letter, to begin with this salutation, this, this form of an opening greeting that we see in verses 1 and 2. We see this in all of Paul's epistles. We also see it in Peter's epistles as well. In this opening salutation, Paul begins with a very warm greeting for his young son in the faith. It has nothing of the smell of the prison in it. Uh, There is no sense of gloom or, or darkness that is actually surrounding Paul. Paul is living a transcendent life in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is living above his circumstances. He is a man who is in Christ and who is living for Christ, and Paul has a note of victory about his life even in this opening greeting. Notice he begins, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Uh, This Paul is the one who was Saul of Tarsus, who had that life-changing encounter with the living Christ on the road to Damascus when he was suddenly converted by the Lord, and he was called into gospel ministry. And since his conversion, 
Paul has been a mighty force as an apostle for the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, more than any other individual on the earth in his generation, has been most responsible for the spread of Christianity and the spread of the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. Paul has been a one-man spiritual SWAT team unleashed upon the world, mighty and bold in his spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has tirelessly preached the gospel he once sought to destroy. He has already been imprisoned once in Rome, and now he is in his second Roman imprisonment. And you'll note he identifies himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus. He is not a prisoner of Rome in his own mind. In fact, he is held captive by the will of God for his life, for he says an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. He does not see himself as a victim of circumstances. There is no poor mouthing that is coming from Paul's lips and pen. There is no whining. There is no complaining. There is only a note of triumph and victory under the banner of his sovereign God who by his will has called Paul into ministry. And as Paul is in this Roman imprisonment, he understands that he is there by the will of God, just as he has been called as an apostle by the will of God. Now, the word apostle means one who is sent. It was one who had authority in the church and over the church on behalf of Christ. Every New Testament book was written either by an apostle or backed by an apostle. And as Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, he's not showing off, he's not pulling rank, he is simply letting them know that this letter is not like the normal letter you will receive in the mail. This is not the normal correspondence that you receive from other friends. This is from an apostle, meaning it is authoritative, it is directional for the life of the church, and any Christian that picks it up should pick it up and read it as though it is God speaking through this letter to them. And as we will study this book, we will hear the voice of God in every word, every jot, every tittle, every verb tense. This is God giving direction to His church by the will of God, speaking to the sovereign will of God. Paul did not sign up to be an apostle. He did not respond to an ad that he saw posted somewhere in Tarsus. No, he was arrested by sovereign grace, and it was God who called him into gospel ministry. Paul was foreordained for this. Paul was predestined for this. Paul was born for this ministry. Now, I want you to see what's at the heart of all ministry. Notice the next words. According to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. This refers to the gospel in terms and words that are very unique to this context. When he says according to, it's a a Greek word that means in conformity to, that his whole ministry is to be in conformity to the gospel. Now, the gospel is represented here as the promise of life in Christ Jesus. Uh, I want to pick apart each one of these words just for a moment. But what Paul is saying is that he has been called to preach the promise of life in Christ Jesus. He has been called by God to teach the promise of life in Christ Jesus. This is the very heart of his message. And whether he is writing to the Colossians or to the Ephesians or to the Thessalonians or whether he finds himself in Rome, this is the constancy that was at the very center of his ministry. He says that the gospel is the promise of life in Christ Jesus. Uh, The word the speaks to the exclusivity of this promise. 
the exclusivity of this gospel. This is not a promise. This is the promise, the one and only promise of life. There is no life outside this promise of life. The word promise itself indicates the certainty of the gospel. The underscores the exclusivity of it, promise the certainty of it. The gospel promises the forgiveness of sin. The gospel promises a new life, a new start. The gospel promises a home in heaven. The gospel promises reconciliation with God. The word life speaks to the vitality of the gospel. The promise of life. Only the gospel can give eternal life and abundant life and supernatural life. Without the promise of life, one has merely existence. Without the promise of life, one has merely an, an empty shell of a life. But when we come to believe the promise of life, suddenly there is the vitality of knowing God and life begins to course through our soul. And then he concludes, in Christ Jesus. Now, this speaks to the exclusivity and the finality of the gospel. It was all accomplished by Christ. It is all in Christ. In fact, we could put it this way, Christ is the gospel. There is no gospel, there is no promise of life outside of Jesus Christ. And Paul's turning his cards over at the very beginning. He is putting it out front and center. This is the, the very pulse and heartbeat of his ministry. It is all about preaching, teaching, guarding, defending, writing, singing, living the promise of life in Christ Jesus. Now, in verse 2, he addresses to whom this letter is written. To Timothy, my beloved son. It's very similar to how 1 Timothy begins in chapter 1, verse 2, where Paul refers to Timothy as my true child in the faith. He plays off of this metaphor or this image. It's not saying that he is the biological father of Timothy, and neither is he necessarily claiming to be the one who led Timothy to faith in Christ. In fact, I think Eunice and Lois are probably those who were used to bring him to faith. But as Paul on his missionary journey came through on his second missionary journey and picked up Timothy, Paul assumed the role of a spiritual father to Timothy. Timothy came under his direct influence. Timothy now will replace John Mark, who had bailed out during the, the difficulty of the first missionary journey. And so now Timothy has been chosen by Paul to travel with him along with Silas. He refers to him as my beloved son. What a tender way, what an affectionate way to refer to, to Timothy. Now, please note, he does not refer to Timothy as his buddy or as his brother or as his peer, but as a son, which emphasizes that Paul is the aged apostle who has many years of gospel ministry under his belt. He is very advanced and down the path in the things of life. Young Timothy is, is new to the, to the faith, and he is new to being used by the Lord. And so Paul is a spiritual father to him. He is a discipler. He is a mentor. He is an influencer of Timothy. And Timothy gladly assumes the role of a lesser, of a, of a son. Paul has given to Timothy fatherly wisdom and fatherly advice and fatherly example in the ministry. And so this is how... He represents him at the very beginning of this letter and defines something of this relationship. And all that Paul will have to say to Timothy will be couched in this relationship. 
even when Paul has to speak strongly to Timothy. Get a hold of yourself, young man. It is within the context of fatherly love. And fatherly love, we know, is a strong love. Uh, there is a, a strength about fatherly love. And we all, as children growing up, were so grateful that not only was there a father, but there was also the gentleness of, of a mother. And it is a wonderful uh, compliment. But the role of the father is to be, show strength and to set the pace and to set the example. And this is what Timothy has had in Paul. And God must have great things in store for Timothy for him to be the one to be under the influence of the great preacher and teacher, the Apostle Paul. Now, at the end of this greeting, Paul gives his customary grace, mercy, and peace. Although, normally Paul says grace to you and peace, but in this letter he adds the request for mercy. And it speaks something to the difficulty and the adversity in which Timothy finds himself that there would be this emphasis upon mercy because mercy is seeing someone in, in suffering or in difficulty and for there to be compassion that desires to reach out and to deliver the one who is suffering from their pain. It's an indication of what will come in the rest of this letter that Timothy is in over his head in many ways as a young man in the ministry and he is facing great opposition. And Paul says at the beginning, young man, may you have grace and mercy and peace in your life. This is way beyond just a, a way to start a letter. This is a very sincere desire on Paul's part for Timothy. And I would ask us tonight... Could there be anything more wonderful to have in any of our lives tonight than for God to pour out grace and mercy and peace? I would be satisfied just to have those three tonight. I could go home uh, a happy man in the Lord if God would increase grace, mercy, and peace. Let's think just for a moment what each of those represent. The word grace means divine enable, en enablement. To be and to do all that God calls Timothy to be and do. This is not referring to saving grace. Timothy is, is already a, a true believer in the Lord. In fact, Paul says that at the end of verse 5 regarding this sincere faith. I'm sure that it is in you as well. So this grace goes beyond saving grace. It is a request for sanctifying grace, for supporting grace for serving grace, for sustaining grace. It's, it's divine enablement that comes from the grace of God that supernaturally empowers us and energizes us and enables us to be and do what God requires of us. Apart from God's grace, we're nothing. Apart from God's grace, we can accomplish nothing in the Lord. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. But it is by this grace that flows continually into our lives by the ministry of the Holy Spirit within us, God enables us to do all that He calls us to do. Timothy cannot advance in the ministry in his own strength in his own resources, without this grace. And then mercy, we've already spoken of that, but that speaks of God's tender love that is demonstrated to those who are in a difficult place. Uh, Timothy finds himself in great adversity, and he needs mercy from above. And mercy means relief from suffering, if not from the circumstances, at least from the, 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 the pain inwardly in the midst of the circumstance. And only God can give mercy. Mercy is God's healing balm in the broken heart. 
Timothy needs mercy in the midst of his heartaches, in the midst of his disappointments, in the midst of his challenges. And then peace is an inner tranquility. It is a settled mind, a still heart, in the midst of life's battles. And Timothy needs this in fullest measure. And then he concludes, it's all from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. All this is to say that all of these blessings, grace, mercy, and peace, come exclusively from the Father and the Son, and they are mediated by the Spirit. So this is Paul's greeting, and it is a reminder to Timothy of the closeness of their relationship, and as a spiritual father, the desire that he has, that he have the abundant blessings of God upon him. Now note second, Paul's gratitude. Paul is thankful. And again, this sounds strange for a man who is chained in a hole in the ground, in a dark, cold, damp dungeon? For what can Paul be grateful? How can there be thankfulness in his heart? And the reason is, is that he has his eyes on the Lord. He has his eyes by faith upon what God has been doing and is is doing in his life. And he offers thanks to God for Timothy that Timothy has been such a blessing in his life, and he offers thanks to God for Timothy. And we all have people in our lives who have been used in ministry to minister to us, to disciple us, and we must maintain an attitude of gratitude, even in the midst of our trials, offering thanks to God for those whom he has brought into our lives to help equip us in the things of God. So, in verse 3, Paul's gratitude. I thank God. And as he will thank God, he will thank God, as I've said, for Timothy. Now, he expresses the sincerity of his heart, how genuinely thankful that he is by these next words whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did. That is a way of saying, I'm telling you the truth. There is no hypocrisy in my words. Uh, There is no hyperbole in what I'm saying. Uh, There is no duplicity. When I say, I am thankful to God for you, Timothy... I am saying this with a clear conscience. We all have a conscience inside of us, and it is the courtroom in which there is rendered the verdicts of what is right and what is wrong. And our conscience affirms us when we do what is right before the Lord. And when we have the inner sense of feeling guilty, that I should not have said that, I should not have done that, and it continues to nag us, that is a blessing from God. That is our conscience not letting us off the hook until we make the matter right. By repentance and asking for someone's forgiveness or restitution or whatever is necessary so that my conscience will say to me that I am now restored in doing what is right before God. Guilt is a good thing. Guilt, is, guilt in the soul is like pain in the body. And pain in the body lets you know that something is wrong. And if we did not have pain, we could have, for example, a... Um, a broken ankle, and without pain, we would never know, perhaps, that this ankle is, is broken or something else in our body. And the pain is a, a warning signal to tell us that there must be an amending of that part of the body. Uh, a broken bone needs to be set, or there needs to be some kind of medical care 
and we would not be able to be physically right without pain telling us something is wrong. The same is true in our, in our soul. And guilt is that, and conviction of sin is that which tells our spirit and our soul that there is something that, is, that has gone astray. There is something that is wrong in our lives. And we can read Psalm 51 and Psalm 32 and learn of, of David until he made amends for his sin and confessed his sin and repented. There was deep inner turmoil in his heart and soul. And there are those today in what I call a hyper-grace movement who never want to talk about guilt or a guilty conscience. But it is a blessing from God that puts its finger on the live nerve within us that lets us know that we have departed from the path of, of love and purity and we need to make the matter right with a brother or a sister or a parent or even just someone in the world. Now, Paul says, I thank God, and as I say this, I am saying this with a clear conscience. And ultimately, we stand our fall with our clear conscience. And others can evaluate us, and others can appraise us, but Paul even said to the church at Corinth, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you. Paul admits that ultimately what is right in his life, it will be determined in the courtroom of his own conscience. So, having said that, Paul says, I have a clear conscience. In other words, I am speaking to you words that are true, and my conscience bears witness that this is true as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Now, this really lets us look into the heart of the Apostle Paul. Uh, this man who was such a towering intellect, this man who was such a powerful preacher, this man who was such a, a, a brilliant theologian, this man who was such an articulate writer of, of Scripture, was also a man who had tender affections for people around him. He wasn't perfect, but he says of Timothy that I am constantly remembering you in my prayers night and day. In other words, you are continually on my mind. You are continually on my heart. You are constantly in my prayers. Now in verse 4, he gets to the matter of his desire for Timothy. Uh, under this heading of, of his gratitude for Timothy, he says, longing to see you. Paul's affection and love for Timothy just comes gushing forth out of his heart and through his pen. He says, I am longing to see you. Paul, this very rugged individualist who could be on the mission field and stand as one man in a synagogue against all the opposition, and yet there is this desire for him to see Timothy. And I think the reason is Timothy's fellowship in the gospel and in the Lord provided something for Paul that was very necessary for his spiritual endurance. Uh, there is something about a young man in the ministry who is very enthusiastic and who is very supportive and who is very wholehearted and who is very idealistic to the point of being totally committed to the task of this mission that is before us. Timothy, no doubt, brought that into this relationship with Paul as they are on their journey. Even in the book of Genesis, it, sa it says, it is not good for the man to be alone. And the same is true in ministry, and Timothy provides enthusiasm, and Timothy 
provides encouragement, and Timothy provides affirmation that even Paul needs. And so Paul says, I long to see you. And then he says, even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. As he thinks of of Timothy, he remembers the tears that Timothy shed. That for Timothy, this wasn't a profession. For Timothy, this wasn't just a, a vocation. For Timothy, this was life and death ministry. And his heart was totally engaged. And his attitude was, whatever it takes, Paul, I am here for you to help you and to support you. And so bonded was their relationship that it involved tears on the part of young Timothy at time. We are not told specifically what these tears were that were produced by that came gushing forth uh, out of his eyes. It may have been Timothy's tears of 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 sorrow over disappointment in the ministry as he would come and cry on the shoulder of the Apostle Paul. It may have been tears of anguish and pain and disappointment. It may have been tears of joy over success in the ministry and just rejoicing in God with, with, with Paul as, as he would just burst forth in tears what God has done through our ministry together. It may have been Timothy's tears of sadness when they departed. You remember in Acts chapter 20 and the tears that were shed by the elders at Ephesus when, when Paul uh, departed from them and they just clung to his neck and, and they shed tears. It may have been something like that. But those tears in a very real way poured into Paul's heart and had an effect upon Paul and had an effect of, of energizing Paul and, and encouraging him and strengthening him. Now in verse 5, he goes on to talk about his gratitude for Paul, uh, for Timothy, yet a little bit more. Verse 5 begins with the word for, which means verse 5 is an explanation of what has preceded. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you. That is why Paul is ultimately thankful for Timothy. Timothy, I'm sure, brought much giftedness. Timothy, I'm sure, brought, uh, as I've already said, much to the table with encouragement and enthusiasm. But most of all, Paul is thankful for the sincere faith that is in Timothy. Faith in the Lord. Faith in the Word of God. Faith in the truth and sound doctrine. Faith in the invisible hand of God working in the affairs of providence. Paul says, I am mindful of the sincere faith. And this word sincere means genuine, without pretense, without deceit. And the word faith speaks of Timothy's commitment to Christ. And let me give it to you in one word. It was real. It was the real deal. It went way beyond just Timothy's words and way beyond how Timothy presented himself to people or to Paul. Paul saw in Timothy a sincere commitment to without hypocrisy to the Lord and to the things of the Lord. And Paul is thankful for this. Even in the midst of the difficult circumstance in which he finds himself, there is a strength in Paul's heart as he reflects upon the firm commitment of Timothy. Then he says at the end of verse 5, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois, and your mother, Eunice. Later in this book, in chapter 3 and verse 15, Paul will describe how Timothy was taught the Scripture from a youth. And Lois and Eunice were true believers in the Lord, and they were rooted in the Word of God. They were rooted especially in Old Testament Scripture. And whatever access to, to New Testament Scripture, 
circular books that were going on. I'm not certain what that would be. But nevertheless, this faith, which is in Timothy, it was first in his grandmother, and his grandmother, no doubt, had an influence upon his mother, and his grandmother and mother then had an influence upon Timothy. We will never know in this world the full effect and influence of a mother upon her children. The one who rocks the cradle is the one who rocks the world. It is the one who has the influence upon the son and upon the daughter. And I'm sure they had little idea what all God would call Timothy, their son and grandson, to do, but they were feeding in him the Word of God. They were pouring into him uh, the, the truth. They were living it out. They were supporting it. They were, they, were, uh, they were affirming it in Timothy. And Paul understands that now this precious young man who has been put into my hands, I am simply reaping the fruit of where others have sowed the seed, tilled the soil, cultivated the land, and it was Eunice and it was Lois who have poured themselves into Timothy, and now I come along on my second missionary journey, and here now is, is a young man who is deposited into my care and who comes with a spiritual vitality about his faith. And so no doubt Paul, in expressing his gratitude for Timothy, also has Eunice and Lois on his mind as well. And when Paul came through in Acts chapter 16, and he came through where Timothy was as he passed back through the cities in Galatia, he no doubt met these two women and knows them well, or knows them enough to remember them by name, and he offers thanks for them as well. Tonight, before we go any further, I want to encourage you to give thought even right now to who are those people who have faithfully ministered and brought the Word of God to you, who have left their imprint upon your life, a father, a mother, a grandparent, a pastor, a friend, a mentor, a teacher, we are all the sum and substance of various influences that have been brought to bear upon our lives. And when we find ourselves in dark dungeons and in cold prison cells and in difficult places in our lives, there is a strength for us to remember the people who have invested in us in spiritual things in the kingdom of God and to see the effect that it has had upon my life. And I, for one, as I think of people like this in my life, I feel a, a stewardship of what has been entrusted to me for it to not slip through my fingers and for me not to fumble this, but for a, a, a stewardship that has been entrusted to me that I will be faithful with this and I will pass it on to others, but I will also cling to it in my own life. And there is also a sense of accountability that if I fall into sin and if I fail in the ministry, those who have built their lives into me, there is a sense of loss that they will suffer, that I will be a disappointment to them, and rightly so. And so as you give thought about who has built into you Christian truth and Christian values, there should be a high sense of responsibility and accountability that we all feel towards those who have built into our lives. Paul concludes verse 5 by saying, and I am sure that it is in you as well. This is his affirmation and confirmation upon young Timothy's life as if he is saying, Timothy, I saw it in your grandmother, I saw it in your mother, and I see it in you, 
it is a sincere faith, it is a vibrant faith, it is a growing faith, young man, you've got the real deal inside of you. Now, I want to look finally at Paul's guidance. All of this has been preparatory for now what follows. Paul has put his arm around young Timothy because Paul has something very difficult to say to Timothy. And if Paul had started the letter at this point, it would have been very abrupt. Uh, Timothy, no doubt, would have taken steps back. It would have been difficult for him to have received it. But after he has heard that you are my beloved son, I have you in my mind, I am thankful for you. Um, I see the sincere faith in your life. He is now ready to bring a corrective into young Timothy's life. And every young Timothy needs periodically a corrective like this. So Paul's guidance, verses 6 and 7. I want us to look at these verses. There's something very important that Paul is saying here to Timothy that we need to hear. So verse 6, For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God. This implies something. And it implies that the gift of God in Timothy a gift to preach and to teach, I would assume that that gift is cooling off, that that gift is not being used. And I can only imagine as Paul, excuse me, as Timothy finds himself in this very difficult ministry place in Ephesus that he is being pulled in every different direction and the gift of God is not being utilized as it should be. Now, let me try to to explain this. This gift, the gift of God, is obviously a divine gift. It has been given by God for Timothy's service of the Lord. Every believer has a spiritual gift. You have a spiritual gift. I have a spiritual gift. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Peter 4 gives us lists of what some of these spiritual gifts are. Uh, A spiritual gift is a supernatural, God-given ability to serve the Lord. And for Timothy, the assumption I would make is, it is a reasonable assumption, that it has to do with his giftedness in the ministry of the Word of God. It would probably have to do with giftedness to preach, giftedness to teach, And this gift is compared to a fire, like a campfire, within Timothy that must be kept burning brightly. But something has happened in Timothy. And Timothy's gift is cooling off. Uh, His preaching is cooling off. It's not as dynamic as it was previous. He is not as passionate as he was previous. He is not preaching as a man on fire. The gift is is no longer on fire. The flame has dwindled to a flicker. That is the imagery in the first half of verse 6. Something has poured cold water on his once hot flame. Something is quenching the spirit in Timothy. Something is holding him back from the full fervent exercise of his spiritual gift in ministering the Word of God and the entire church is suffering for it. Uh, William Hendrickson in his commentary writes, Paul knew that the fire of Timothy's charisma, which is the Greek word for gift, was burning low. So, that is why Paul says in verse 6, Timothy, you must kindle afresh the gift of God. 
Uh, first of all, this is Timothy's responsibility. Lois can't do this for him. Eunice cannot stir up the gift of God within him. Not even Paul can do this for Timothy. And God can, but God will not, independent of Timothy assuming responsibility for his own spiritual gift. What Paul is saying to Timothy is, fan the flame of this gift. Stir up the embers within you, Timothy. Keep the flame alive and going. Keep the flame uh, strong. Stoke the fire. When the flame was burning brightly, Timothy was on fire and he was a force for God in the church at Ephesus. But he no longer is. When the flame was fully ignited, there was in Timothy a blazing, passionate, fervent, intense, serving and preaching and teaching. There was a note of urgency about his ministry. There was a note of intensity about his ministry. And when the flame was burning brightly, Timothy was contagious in the church. And the fire spread to the pew and to the others who were under the, the fiery use of his spiritual gift. That is what Paul is saying here. And he said, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. This, this refers to one of two things. It refers either to the time when Timothy was saved, that Paul was there shortly thereafter and laid hands upon him in confirmation, and he received his spiritual gift at the time of his salvation, which is obviously true, or this may refer to what 1 Timothy 4, verse 14 speaks of, a time when the elders gathered together around Timothy and laid hands on Timothy like an ordination service. It really is secondary to the major point that Timothy has, been, has received a spiritual gift from the Lord. It is like a, a fire that is within him. And the more that Timothy is being rightly used by the Lord, there is an igniting and there is a, a fire about his ministry. But now it is like cold water has been poured onto his gift and Paul is bringing it to his attention. You're still preaching and you're still teaching and you're still pastoring. You are there in Ephesus. You're still going through all the motions, but it's not the same, Timothy. And I've got to tell you this. As I am passing off the scene and as you are taking the baton and taking the gospel, you've got to pull out of this and you've got to kindle afresh the gift that is in you. Say, by the way, you have a gift in you too. And you need to stir up the gift that is in you and it is a part of the passion and ardency of your spiritual life. And it is contagious. And when you are operating with your spiritual gift and there is an energy from God as you use it, it spreads to others in the body of Christ and the whole body is blessed. But when something is poured onto us, cold water... The entire church suffers. And so we ask ourselves, what was this cold water that was poured onto Timothy? What is it that has knocked the legs out from underneath him that he is no longer the man of God that he once was with, with supernatural impact? Verse 7 tells us, you'll note that verse 7 begins with the word for. It is an explanation for verse 6. Verse 7 is the explanation why. Timothy needs and must kindle afresh the gift of God. Here is why the fire is dwindling. Here is why the flame is but barely flickering. 
For God has not given us a spirit of timidity. You know what was holding back Timothy? The fear of man. Nothing will pour cold water upon a young preacher, a middle-aged preacher, or an old preacher. Like a spirit of timidity. And on the very front doorstep of this book, before Paul even wades out into the deeper water of what he has to say, he says on the very front end, this is why you need to kindle afresh the gift of God. You are overcome with a spirit of timidity, and Timothy, it's not from God. You have become overly cautious. You have become trying to be politically correct. You have tried to play all ends in the middle and, and in some ways we can imagine trying to please everybody. Timothy, God has not given this to you. It has come from your flesh. And it has come perhaps even from Satan himself. This is why Timothy's gift has cooled off in preaching it is timidity. The word timidity means fear. It denotes being cowardly. It represents being in the grip of shameful fear that is caused by weak character. It is, as I have already alluded, it is the fear of of man. And Paul is saying to Timothy, listen, every time you step into the pulpit, you need to have your letter of resignation signed, sealed, and in your back pocket as you stand to teach the truth and preach the truth of the Word of God. Now let me tell you what Timothy was up against before we unpack some more of this. There in the church at Ephesus, Timothy was in a very difficult church. Unlike this church, Timothy was in a very difficult place. There were false teachers in the church spreading heresies. And all of this we know from 1 Timothy. There were aggressive women who were overstepping their God-assigned boundaries. Now, maybe we can understand a little bit better why there was such timidity in Timothy. There were women in the church, matriarchs, who wanted to be public teachers and preachers of the Word of God and who wanted to exert an undue influence in the leadership of the church. And Timothy is beginning to buckle under the influence of these older women in the church. There were also unqualified elders and unqualified deacons who were serving in the church. And on top of that, there were people who were looking down upon Timothy's youthfulness. Young man, we were here before you came to this church, and young man, we'll be here after you leave. This is our church. Young man, who do you think you are to tell us what's wrong about our church? And Timothy begins to buckle under this. And Timothy shifts into reverse. And perhaps with, a, at the beginning, good motives and good intentions of, of trying to be a peacemaker and, and trying to, to, to find some common ground and to try to find some common agreement. But the next thing you know, Timothy's gift of God to preach and teach the Word of God, it is quenched and that fire is no longer blazing and because of that, the spiritual life of the entire church is taking a nosedive. Proverbs 29, verse 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare, 
That is to say, it is the fear of man that entraps us. It holds us back. When there is the fear of, of man, God looks small and man looks big. Proverbs 28, verse 1 says, The wicked flee when no one is pursuing. In other words, they're scared of their own shadow. Someone coughs and they, and they are sent into a, a state of panic. Now, to succumb to the fear of man in the ministry can be caused by those, one, outside the church, two, those inside the church. Timothy is suffering, no doubt, from both. There is the fear of man, of those outside the church, as the threat of Roman persecution was escalating now to a higher degree of intensity under the emperor Nero. Paul is suffering for the gospel. Paul is arrested. Paul is soon to be put to death because of Nero and because of the gospel. And Timothy, no doubt, is beginning to swallow hard and know that after they put Paul to death, they may be coming after those who are under his ministry. And Timothy, perhaps, is thinking, I may be number two on the list. I traveled with Paul. I preached with Paul. I served with Paul. And so there is a fear of those out in the world but also there is the fear of believers inside the church. And I think that this is always the greatest source of fear because believers spend so much time together. Many in the church at Ephesus were becoming resentful of Timothy. And I've already walked through what some of those reasons are. His, his young age, no doubt the doctrine that he was preaching, uh, that he wasn't maintaining high standards for those who serve as elders and those who serve as deacons and becoming a people pleaser. And then this matter of women who have gone far beyond their God-assigned place in the church. And, and no doubt some of the high doctrine that, 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 that Timothy was preaching, not the least of which is what Paul says in verse 9 here in this very context that God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which He granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. I don't know what all was going on in the church at Ephesus, but that too may have been a burr in the saddle for those to whom Timothy was preaching. And so he says, Timothy, this is why your fire is dwindling, this is why the power of God is not upon your life and your ministry as it once was. It is because you have succumbed to a spirit of timidity and you have become very cowardly in your pastoral ministry. And it is not from God. He concludes this verse by saying, what is from God and what it is that is blazing very strongly when the fire is fanned and the flame enlarges and the gift is used but of power and love and discipline. Timothy, this is what you need to recover in your life. This is what is desperately needed in your ministry. Power is power to stand strong. It is power to hold fast. It is power to overcome temptation. And later in this next chapter, in chapter 2, verse 1, he will say, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Timothy, you need God's power in your life if you were to exercise your gift and to be a mighty force for God. And then second, love. A great balance. Because you can't really love people when you're fearful of them and when you are retreating from them. You need to have true love. Love for God. 
Love for the church. Love for the purity of the church. Love for the truth. Love for believers. Love for unbelievers. Timothy, there is no true love coming from you if you're not speaking the truth in love. And then discipline, which is the very opposite of fear and cowardice. A discipline refers to self-control, meaning you're not overreacting to things. You're not so easily moved and swayed. When one is fearful, you can just step on a branch and be scared and think someone's shooting at you. You need, you need discipline, Timothy. You need self-control. Self-control, this discipline, includes not caving in to pressure, not giving up, not overreacting, but staying the course and pressing onward and forward in ministry. This is Paul's guidance for Timothy. And in a very real way, every one of us here tonight is a Timothy to Paul. We are all under his influence as he is writer of Holy Scripture. The relationship that each one of us who are true believers have with Paul, he is, he is an elder brother to us. He is a mentor to us. He is a leader to us. We all should desire to pattern our life after the Apostle Paul. In fact, he tells us, follow me as I follow Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. And so if we are to be Timothys to Paul, then there cannot be a spirit of timidity. Now, this does not mean that we have a, a green light to be needlessly abrasive. Uh, this does not mean that we operate in an autocratic sense, that there is no sense of, of yielding to one another in the things of the Lord. God forbid... May it never be. But it does mean that if we are to be Timothys to Paul and Timothys to others who are ahead of us in a long line of godly men who leave their influence upon us, we can never allow the fear of man to quench the fire within us. This is exactly what Timothy Needed And Paul has put his finger on the live nerve in Timothy's life. And Paul cannot even wait until chapter 2 or chapter 3 or chapter 4. I don't have time to mince. They may be coming for me to pull me out of this cell uh, in a matter of moments. I do not know when they're going to come. I must get this message to you, Timothy, because you must run with the baton that I've put into your hand and the truth that I've invested in you. And it's got to be far more than you just know the truth, Timothy. You must kindle afresh the gift within you so that you can preach and teach and use the Word of God in the lives of others. So how do we overcome the fear of man? There's one simple way. There must be a greater, greater fear of someone else that displaces the fear of man. It's that simple. There's not ten things. There's not twenty things. There's one thing. And that one greater fear is the fear of God. The fear of God is that which gives us boldness. It gives us courage. If God be for me, who can be against me? It is the fear of God that reminds us that God plus one always makes a majority. It is the fear of God that reminds us that there is a time and a day of final accountability that every Christian will have at the judgment seat of Christ. And we will give an account of our ministry and our influence and all that has been entrusted to us in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there have been opportunities. There have been open doors. There is a stewardship that is entrusted to every one of us. Right this very second, there is a stewardship from me to you that you are now entrusted with what you have heard in this message. 
There's a stewardship for me as I have poured through this text and, and dug into these verses and written it out with my own hands into my notes, a sense of this being written within me. And there is a greater accountability that I have to God than perhaps you, even you will have as one who hear this, hears this truth. James 3, 1 says, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing as such we shall incur a stricter judgment. And so there must be this healthy, holy, reverential awe that we feel in our hearts towards God. Knowing that we will give an account to Him in the last day. And when we have feared Him and been bold in the things of the Lord here, it will go well for us in that last day. I want it to go well for you. For you to be crowned by the Lord will be my crown. The only reward for me will be to see you rewarded. And you will want crowns to cast at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in part, it is measured by how you have kindled afresh the gift of God within you. If you are saved, you have the gift of God within you, a spiritual gift to serve the Lord. And as Paul addresses Timothy, he speaks first to this matter. May the Lord here tonight in all of our hearts take the truths of these verses that we have looked at tonight as we have heard this aged apostle speak to his young son in the faith, this veteran missionary, this seasoned preacher, speak to young Timothy. May we all take it to heart and may we all be bold and courageous in the Lord and in the things of God May we hold tenaciously to the truth, for he has given to us a spirit of power and love and discipline. May the Lord give us much grace, much mercy, and much peace in this. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for what Paul has written to Timothy. We know it is timeless. It is applicable to every believer in every generation, on every continent, in every age. And Lord, help us to see the relevancy of this toward us, even this night, as we serve you. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.